Man, we want to say uh, good evening to everyone. We thank everyone for coming out tonight, for being a part of this Bible study and getting into the Word. We thank God for the praise and worship that uh, we've experienced tonight. And we thank God for His presence being here with us. We started a series uh, last Sunday on um, the importance of confessing our sins. And this will be the second part of that that series, the importance of, of uh, confessing our sins. As we stated before, uh, before God can help us in anything that we do for him, the first thing we have to do is be humble. And with humility comes a mirror that helps us to see ourselves, to see where we are, uh, to see where we're lining up with God's word. <clears throat> in, in preaching this kind of message, of course, there will be some um, um, problems concerning, you know, people who are uh, on one side or the other. Some people think that, okay, we're under grace and grace covers our sins and so we're good. We can just continue to sin and grace will cover it. And then you have those that say, well, we can't sin at all. Let's not, let's not do anything. Let's just work. Let's just op obtain our salvation through our works. And uh, so you have the, the, uh, extremes of both sides on opposite sides of the street but where we meet at tonight is a the middle of the street what what the word of god says because we know that we're in this flesh and as long as we're in this flesh of course we were born and shaped in iniquity and things like that but at the same time the word of god tells us that we should not turn the grace of god into lasciviousness in other words you don't use god's grace as an excuse to continue in sin. And so this is the middle of the road that we're going to meet at. The bottom line is this. If you truly love the Lord, if you truly love God, and you understand that God is your father, then you don't want to do anything to hurt him. Yes, he'll forgive you. Let's think of it this way. I have a wife, a beautiful wife, a loving wife. And uh, I believe that my wife trusts me with all her heart, and I believe that she loves me with all of her heart. She does. She loves me. And uh, say, for instance, I may take a trip one day to go preach somewhere or whatever I may take a trip to do. And I know without a shadow of a doubt that she loves me unconditionally, regardless of my faults, regardless of my failures and, and things like that. She loves me unconditionally. And I may take a trip and I may take some woman out on a date or do something like that, you know, to, to dishonor her, to dishonor my wife, something that's going to bother her or that's going to hurt her. And I come home and I say, well, wife, um, you have two sides of that. I can come home and not say anything. And of course, you know, if she's playing the role of God, then she already knows. But I don't say anything. It's covered. Grace will cover me, you know, or I may conf confess to her, uh, wife, I did this bad thing. I, I took this woman out or whatever it was I may have done, and she'll say, okay, I love you. I love you unconditionally. When I married you, I, I promised you that I would be with you, and I said my vows before God, and I said that I would be to you, with you until death do us part. So that's fine. You know, she's forgiven me. But listen to this. The forgiveness does not take away the hurt. And if I truly love her, the last thing I want to do is betray her in that manner. Everybody understand? And so when we have a relationship with God, we don't say, well, God will forgive. He's God. It ain't nothing to it. He, you know, he, he'll forgive. I can just continue to do what I'm going to do. He knows I, I got these urges and he knows I'm human and, and things like that. Eventually, we have to get to a place where we love God so much that we don't want to hurt him. We don't want to do anything that's going to hinder or harm our relationship. And, and whether we know it or not, we serve a God that if he's going to commission us, if, he, if we're going to do what he's called us to do, he has to be able to trust us with what he's given us or what he's commissioned us to do. So, yes, my wife may forgive me for something that I've done, you know, to, to, to taint our marriage and to dishonor our marriage. But you know what? Pretty soon, if I keep doing it, that trust is going to get lesser and lesser. And before you know it, it's going to put a certain strain on our relationship where uh, she's going to begin to question whether or not, I love her. This is why we read in a new covenant. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. In other words, if you love God, you'll do what he say do. 
you'll do what it takes to honor the covenant that you've made with God. And that's, so it's that way in marriage, and it's also that way with our marriage to Jesus Christ, that we'll do whatever it takes to honor our covenant with him. So we have to get out of this business of, well, grace will cover it. In other words, God's love for me, it overrides anything I can do. We might get on that uh, at, a, at a later date, but if you read in the 51st number of Psalms, where David is uh, repenting for the sin that he's committed with sleeping with Bathsheba, you'll see that uh, he, one of the things he says is, against thee and thee only have I sinned. In other words, when we recognize that what we're doing in our bodies, or what we're doing regardless if, if we're sinning, we're truly sinning against God. Everybody understand? So no matter what we do, yes, you may hurt somebody else in the process. Yes, I may hurt my wife if I, if I uh, step outside of our marriage. But in reality, not only am I hurting her and sinning against her, but I'm also sinning against God. And this is where our confession comes in at. Why? Because confession says, Lord, I've done wrong. I recognize the wrong that I've done, and I'm going to turn from that. You see, so we can't make excuses. I can't tell my wife, well, you know, I got these strong urges. I, you know, I, I just can't be with you. I, it, it's other people out there that I want to be with and things like that. That won't fly. And, and just like that excuse won't work with my wife, neither will it work with God. So we have to be humble. We have to know what kind of relationship we have with God. And I, and I sincerely believe that if you truly love God with all of your heart, you don't want to hurt him. And not only that, he's not man or human where you can hide anything from him. So confession is necessary. Why? Because confession is the first thing that starts the healing process. That's what starts the mending of the relationship. Everybody understand? It's much easier to deal with an unfaithful spouse when they have confessed because at least you know since they've confessed they know that they've done wrong they're not trying to hide it from me and we can begin the healing process now i can begin to try to restore them and 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 gain faith and trust in them again and so this is what confession does for god it tells god that i recognize that i've done wrong and so here i am before you i'm open before you this is all my garbage this is all of my trash what can you do to fix me but oftentimes we try to hide it from God. We think God is like a man. We think that we can hide things from him or we think, well, it's not hurting God. What does God care? Or we make the excuse, well, God made me this way. He understands. You know, the Bible, and I've heard people say that, and I'm sure I, I'm, and myself have used that, you know, but God knows my heart. That's the wrong thing to say before a holy God because the Bible clearly states to us that the heart is deceitful above all. Who can know it? In other words, the Bible lets us know that we ourselves don't even know our hearts. But God tries that heart. He, he tries our spirit and he, he knows what anger we're coming from. And so what we have to do is ask the Lord, Lord, am I right? You know, because I have found myself, you know, in, in my growing with the Lord, I have found myself checking my motives and checking things. You know, it. It's really something when you when you look into your growth process and you see maybe at one time you thought that you were right about something or maybe at one time you really thought that you were doing something that was righteous and, and God would not look down on. And then you, you hear a message or God start dealing with you about it. And before you know it, God is showing you, you know, you're crooked, you're dirty. A prime, a good example of that is Paul, the apostle. Uh, the Bible makes it clear, and he makes it clear in his epistle, that when I was persecuting the church, God had mercy on me because I was doing it in ignorance. He really thought he was doing the will of God. He really thought he was a foot soldier for God. You see, he really thought that he was doing the will of God. But God had to come and have an encounter with him and show him, no, it's me that you're persecuting. So what does that do? In other words, that tells, that puts the thing against that, that pits a, that against this whole idea of it's the people that I've sinned against. And Jesus took the blame and said, no, it's me that you're sinning against, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? What happened? He wasn't throwing Jesus in jail. He wasn't stoning Jesus. But Jesus took it personal. And so and that's what we have to do when we, when we have our relationship with God. Whatever we decide we're going to do against one of our brothers or our sisters, we better know that God takes it personal. 
which should always should lead us to confession. God, I've sinned against my brother or my sister. I've made it right with them. Now I'm coming to you asking you to forgive me and to cleanse me. Why? Because ultimately we want to be like God. So let's go to the 32nd number of Psalms. Let's go to the 32nd number of Psalms. My prayer is that we'll continue to grow in this area of confessing our sins. Now, the bottom line is we cannot be clean or cleansed from any sin that we don't confess. And, I, I, you know, I, I tell you this. We, we have a guarantee in the first chapter of 1 John, what we read when we went over this uh, last week, that he is faithful and just. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Not only to forgive us, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But what is the key to being cleansed and forgiven? It's confession. And I, you know, I thank God for that. That's, to me, that's a guaranteed forgiveness, is if we confess. That's, we guarantee to be cleansed of our sins if we confess our sins. And that's, I tell you what, that's, to me, that's reassuring. That's reassuring because I know how human I am. I know the mistakes that I've made. I know the mistakes that I have the potential to make. And I just thank God, I, you know, that I can go to him without him judging me. I can go to him and say, look, Lord, I got this problem. I need for you to help me with it. I don't want to be this way. And you know what? God sees that humility in our hearts when we go to him in that manner. And he begins to go to work in our lives. And I'm just thankful to the Lord, to the Lord that he, you know, he forgives us and that he cleanses us. Not only does he forgives us, but he cleanses us. In other words, he makes us us better. He makes us step over that, you know, that that um, thing that may be in our life that's not pleasing to him. He's not a God to say, look, you're not you're not acting right. Yeah, you've confessed, but I'm going to punish you because of it. You know, he forgives us and he cleanses us. And that's that's so, a wonderful thing that to me, that's just very reassuring. And that shows the love of God and how he loves us when he's willing to do that for us. All right, let's go. Uh, We'll start reading at verse 1 in the 32nd number of Psalms. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Uh huh. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputed not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day. Now let's look at what's going on here. David, now David wrote this psalm, and we know if anybody know about the forgiveness and the grace of God, it's King David. And he tells us, when I kept silent, now what is, first he's setting this thing up, that you're blessed. In other words, you're happy when your transgressions are forgiven and your sins are covered. What does that mean? That means sins of the past, things that you've done in your past, that they have been covered. Now how, you know, you, and you've heard me say this before, if you are trying to cover your own sins, and you're not willing to confess your own sins, and you're trying to cover them yourselves, then God himself can't cover your sin. Because he can't cover what you yourself are trying to cover. A good, a very, very good example of that, we read about that in the third chapter of Genesis. After Adam and Eve had, had committed the sin that they committed and disobeying God, what did they do? They went and hid themselves. Then the Bible says that they sold figs, sold fig leaves to try to cover themselves. What were they doing? Their nakedness represented their sin. They didn't know that they were naked until they sinned. So their nakedness represented their sin. So what did they do? They tried to cover their sins with fig leaves. So here come God walking through the garden looking for them. Of course, God knows where they are, but he's trying to make a point. Where are you? Then they say, well, what, what happens? We heard you coming and we feared. Listen to this. That's the first time that we see fear in the Bible is when mankind disobeys God. What happened? They got outside of God's perfect love, outside of that perfect will. And we know what the word says, that perfect love casteth out fear. Why do people walk around fearful, fearful of death? Why do people walk around scared of when they're going to die and try to try to boost their health up by, you know, eating certain a certain way. Now, I'm not against exercise and I'm not against eating healthy. But listen, that has nothing to do with you living a long life. Only God can give you long life. 
So what do people do? What does society do? They try to walk around uh, thinking that they have their own lives in their hands. So I'm going to jog five, five miles a day. I'm going to eat healthy. And some kind of way, that's going to extend my life. I'm going to go to the doctor, get checkups and, and all of these things, and that's going to extend my life. What are they doing? Walking around in fear. Why? Because when you truly trust God and when you truly know who God is, you know that your life is not in your hands, it's in God's hands. But what happens? Pride getting people, they don't want to confess anything. I'm going to live the same old dirty way I've been living, and then I'm going to live a long life because I'm, I'm out exercising and, and eating healthy. That's pride. When you truly know the God that you serve, when you have truly committed your life to God, you have this understanding if you don't understand anything else. You understand that you're not leaving here until you have fulfilled your will in Christ. Until you have done and finished the work that God has called you to do. So why do people walk around in fear? It's because they're not doing the work that God has called them to do in the first place. Why? Because deep down inside, we as human beings know that God's will and his purpose is what our life hangs on. So if I'm not doing God's will, in some kind of way, I got to find a way to, to extend my own life. I got to find a way to live. Everybody understand? And so this is where fear come in at. And so when fear sets in, there's no room for confession. Why? Because confession says, I trust God. I have, I have made a mistake, but confession says, I trust God and I know that he's going to forgive me. You see how, what the Bible says, without faith it's impossible to please God? How can you please God if you're walking around in unrighteousness? Why? Because it's by faith that you accept the righteousness of Jesus Christ in the first place. You see? So confession, why do, why do people have a problem with confession? Because confession says, I trust God enough to know that he's not going to condemn me, to know that he's going to forgive me, and to know that he's going to cleanse me from this unrighteousness. What is confession based on? Confession is based on our relationship with God. Everybody understand? I know my wife loves me, so I have no problem with opening up to her. I have no problem with showing her my shortcomings. In other words, exposing myself to her and letting her know, sweetheart, can you pray for me because I'm having a problem in this area? When I go to her, I know that she's not going to condemn me. But see, if you're married to somebody and you're thinking that they're going to condemn you and you're thinking that they're going to belittle you and not forgive you, you have a problem with going, up, going to them opening up about what's really going on on the inside. And what does that do? It stifles that relationship. So confession is hard when you don't trust the person that you're confessing to, you see. And so a lot of times people have a problem with confessing their sins to the Lord because they don't have the relationship that they need to have with him in the first place. They don't understand God's love and that God's love is present to forgive them. Not only to forgive them, but to cleanse them. You see? And so our confessions is based upon our relationship with God. And so here, David, he's, what is he telling us? Blessed or happy is the man whose transgression is forgiven and whose sins are covered. Now I want you to listen. If we go back to the uh, third chapter of Genesis, we see that Adam and Eve, they made fig leaves. They sewed fig leaves together and covered themselves. And ever since then, mankind have been trying to do that, trying to cover themselves, trying to hide their sin from God, as if you can really hide. And so what did God do? The first thing he did was he called them out. Who told you? You know, they told God, well, we, we were naked, so we hid. What did God say? Who told you you were naked? Now, did God, was God just ignorant and didn't know the story already? Did he really need for them to fill him in on what was going on? No. What was God trying to do when he was calling them out and telling them, who told you you were naked? Okay, well, what happened? Did you eat of that tree that I commanded you not to eat of? And what did Adam say? Lord, it was that woman that you gave me. That's not a confession. Why? Because confession is just between you and God. You're not including anybody else in there on what they've done to you. It's between you and God. It's for you and God's relationship. So what did Adam do? He didn't confess anything. No, he didn't say, Lord, I did wrong. What did he do? He said, it was that woman. It's, she's the reason. So then God questioned her. Well, what did you do? And what did she say? No, it wasn't. It was the serpent. He beguiled me. You see, nobody's confessing. Nobody's confessing. And that's what happens in, in, in everyday life with people. We know that we've done wrong. We know that we've messed up. And what, what was God trying to do? 
he was really trying to restore them, trying to restore the relationship. But a relationship can't be restored if trust is not there. And why is trust not there? Because confessions haven't been made. And so Adam and Eve, they're covering themselves. How? By passing the blame to somebody else. It's not me. God is them. They're the reason. And we see that so many times among married couples. We see that so many times among people. Well, if you don't treat me this way, then I'm not going to treat you that way. If you yell at me, I'm going to yell at you. Nobody's saying, look, even though I've done this, even though you've done this to me, I'm going to be the bigger person and I'm going to act in a godly manner towards you. No, we put the blame on everybody else. We put the we pass it to everybody else. OK, you did this to me. So that's why I reacted that way. No, you reacted that way because that's what's in you to do in the first place. And instead of you passing the blame to brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so or whoever, you need to get before the Lord and confess that that's in you. You see, so what, do we, what happens? We become a, a generation of reactors. We become a generation that don't take the blame for anything. Everything that I do is somebody else's fault. You see, and so we, we just pass it on. To, and so what happens? We, then we become hard-hearted. Why? Because I, we're not responsible. I'm not responsible for the way I act. I just, you know, that's just the way, that's just the way I am. God knows that's the way I am. Yes, he does. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you, because he don't intend for you to stay that way. You see? And so we all we have to be humble. We can't look at how a person have treated us or what they have done to us. You know, and I and I sincerely believe that sometimes we are we, we are placed in the lives of people and we're here for one another. Why? To show us what's in us. Why? Because you need that person to show you. Maybe to act ugly towards you so that you can see what's in you, whether or not you'll pass that test. In other words, you have, a, you know, you go to work. Maybe your boss is having a bad day and they might snap at you. What happens? Do you snap back? You're not supposed to. But when you snap back, you don't say, well, I, I, I did this because you did that. No, it's I did this because that's what's in me and I need God to cleanse me. I need God to come. I need to ask, confess that I have this issue and I, I can't stand and tolerate people being mean to me or whatever the case is. And so, you know, now, God, I'm coming before you and I'm asking you to, to help me. So that's the reason why we're put around people that may what we call bring out the ugly in us or what we may call just, you know, why? Because in order for you to know what's truly in you, it sometimes take people to pull that out and to show you where you are, to show us what's in us. And, that, and, and and honestly, when we look at it, that is the purpose of marriage. That is one of the purposes of marriage to show us what's on the inside of us. It's not until we're living with somebody 24 seven. And you start getting on each other's nerves at times and things like that, and that you really know, OK, Lord, I have a problem with this because my wife or my husband said this to me and this is the way I reacted. I don't want to walk around with a chip on my shoulder and just getting offended at everything my husband or wife said to me. So I need help so that I don't just take everything that's said as, you know, being combative towards me. So you see that this is the reason why. But what starts that is confession. Confession is what starts the healing process. It's what starts us on the right road. Verse two says, blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. And in whose spirit there is no God. You see where that thing is? When you see somebody that's bitter, when you see somebody that's, that's angry and angry all the time or in a bad mood all the time, it has gotten past their flesh. It has gotten past their soul and it is in their spirit. You see that? What, what David says here at the end of this? In whose spirit there is no guile. There is no guile. And so what it is, God, it takes God to get into the spirit of man to, to clean man up. In other words, you know, we've all know and we've all experienced that where we give our life to the Lord and we may try to clean ourselves up. In other words, we say, Lord, I'm going to go all day. I'm not going to think a bad thought about anybody. I'm not going to gossip or whatever the case may be. I'm not going to curse or whatever stronghold we may have had before we got saved. And so we say, Lord, I'm going to go all day and I'm not going to do this. And a lot of times when people say that they have good intentions and that is their intention not to do that. But you know what? You're still in that flesh and you cannot clean yourself. You cannot 
overcome those things through the flesh. In other words, flesh has to die. And so you, you try and then by the end of the day, you failed. You, and then you're disappointed in yourself. Why? David points out here in the second verse here, it says, in whose spirit there is no guile. So why is it that God has to do the cleaning? It's because there, that whole that thing that we're trying to deal with is actually in our spirit. And so whatever is in the spirit is going to manifest itself in the soul and in the flesh realm. That's why confession is important. You can't say, well, God, I'm going to do this my, on my own. No, you need the Holy Spirit. You need God's spirit to get in there and cleanse you. But why? Because those things originate at the spirit of man. Everybody understand? Verse 3 says, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. Now, what is David talking about there? He's saying, when I kept my mouth shut. In other words... Before I got enough sense to confess what I needed to confess. Before I had the mind to repent and confess what was done, I, I had no peace. I, it, it bothered me. You see that? So what what is another reason that we confess to the Lord? It's so that we can have peace. Why? Because, the, you know, deep down inside that God already knows. And so what happens when you walk into the room of somebody that you know you've done something against. There's tension there. You can't go up to them and shake their hand and say, oh, brother or sister, I love you. Thank God. If you done done something against them or whatever, there's going to be tension there. What would that do? That would put a strain in a relationship. Why? Because the issue, that silent issue, haven't been discussed yet. So there's tension there. You see? And so this is what David is saying here. When I kept silent, there was no peace with me. I, I, I couldn't find peace. So how do we find peace? By confessing it. Why? Because we know deep down inside side, that God knows it in the first place. And nine times out of ten, he's sitting back waiting on us to confess to him. You see? He's waiting on us to confess it to him. Why? Because he wants the relationship to be restored. And we know that when tension is there, you, you don't have the nerve to go to God and ask him for things like you would if you knew that your relationship was the way it was supposed to be. And you know your relationship won't be where it's supposed to be if you haven't confessed your sins. So what is the first thing we need to do when we get on our knees and pray before the Lord? We need to thank him for all of his blessings. We need to praise him and honor him. But we also need to confess. We need to confess. Why? Because that gives us the boldness to go before the throne of grace. Then that's when we we get bold. So if you're going to God just kind of iffy and you're not sure, you're not going to get anything. You're not going to get the, the petitions that you're asking for. Why? Because you're not sure. Why aren't you sure? Because you haven't confessed and you know that there's something there. It's just like what David is saying here. Read verse four. It says, for day and night, thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. What is he talking about? Day and night, I, I, I couldn't get any rest and your hand was heavy upon me. What was he talking about? That his conscience was eating away at him. That Holy Spirit that was there to, to convict him was there pressing on him. Look, you need to confess this thing. You've done wrong. You need to make this thing right with God. And see, that's what that's what we lose our peace at. We don't get peace until you and you know, you, you you hear those stories about how when people confess and I've experienced that you confess something that you've done against someone or you confess it to the Lord and you've heard this term is like a weight have lifted off of you. What is that weight? Now, people like, you know, people always say that 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 weight have lifted up off. Of, I felt like a hundred pounds was lifted off of my shoulders. What are they really saying here? What weight is that? Uh, we, we, we is answered here in verse four. What is it for day and night? Thy hand was heavy upon me. You see that? What is that weight that we're talking about? It's God's hand. Why? Because God's hand is on us to show us that something is not right. And I thank God for that heaviness. Why? Because without that heaviness, sometimes we may not do what's right. I thank God that he just doesn't allow us to get away with stuff. Why? Because he loves us too much to let us go to hell being lukewarm. Everybody understand? All right, let's keep reading here. Verse five says, I acknowledge my sin unto thee. You see that? I acknowledge my sin unto thee and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. You see that? So now he moves into this point where he says, I acknowledge my sin. My iniquity have I not hid. 
Why? Because when you hide something, you can't acknowledge it. You can't acknowledge it when you're hiding it. So what does that take? It takes humility to be there. He says, I will confess my transgressions. Now listen, the mistake that many people make, they feel like, well, you know, they, they, they take a casual approach to sin. They don't want to confess anything. They think, well, God knows I'm sorry. You notice that? David says here, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Look at that word there. It says transgressions. That's plural. That means that we can't just go to God when we're confessing and saying, God, I'm human. I messed up. Forgive me for all of the sins I've made. I've, I've committed today. No, God actually want us to come to him. You know, the Bible says that uh, that every knee will bow, bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. It's that name that everything under heaven and earth is going to bow to. So if we name the name of Jesus Christ, when we're looking for salvation and looking for grace, isn't it only right that we name the things in our lives by name that that we expect Jesus Christ to cover? We can't have a backbiting tongue and just go to the Lord and say, Lord, I just forgive me. You know, I've messed up. Forgive you for what? You see, when you begin to name those things in your life that, you know, God isn't pleased with, then the blood of Jesus can cover that particular thing. In the last uh, teaching that we did concerning this subject, we mentioned the, the washing machine and the dryer. The washing machine, how, you, you know, we have to bring our clothes. We have to admit that our clothes need to be washed and then we bring them. But in that same instance, you know how every piece of clothing has its own. If you look on the tag in the back, it has what cycle that need to be used to clean that particular thing. So you don't throw the whites in with the colors. And all of that, you, you, you throw the whites in with the whites. Why? Because you're going to use bleach. It's going to take something a little bit different to clean that up. You see? And so what, is, what happens? You have to identify. You have to separate that laundry. And you have to identify what you need to do to get that thing clean. And so, <clears throat> so what do we do? We identify the sins that are in our lives. We don't just, why? Because that makes us face that thing head on. Everybody understand? You notice that when, when God came to Adam and Eve in the third chapter of Genesis, he didn't say, look, did y'all sin against me? He named the sin that they did. What did he say? Did y'all eat of the tree that I told y'all not to eat of? So what was it? He wanted them to confess that particular thing because that particular thing is what, what caused the rift in a relationship in the first place. So... Going back to the example that I used earlier, if I'm unfaithful to my wife or if a man is unfaithful to her, his his uh, his wife, he, he can't go to his wife and say, look, dear, you know, I'm human. I got these urges. Can you forgive me? I'm going to try to be a better husband. That isn't confessing anything. What did you do? What did you talk about? You're going to be, you know, in other words, that thing need to be settled. And the, the sin that has been committed has to be admitted. It has to be admitted to that spouse, to the one, to the injured party, what we call you see, and so the particulars, so you can't go generally speaking. Why? Because when you do that, it leaves the door open for you to commit it again. Let me say this, and this is a key point in this message. It's not the sin so much that get the person in trouble with the Lord. It's their attitude toward the sin that get that person in trouble with the Lord. Everybody understand? I honestly believe that if Adam and Eve had confessed their sins and had had the right attitude, God would have restored them some kind of way. But because they didn't confess, what was their attitude? Somebody else is the reason why I did what I did. Well, you, you can't be restored if your attitude isn't right. So what attitude do we need to have against it? We have to hate evil. We have to hate sin. And that is what keeps us from going back and committing that thing again. Why? Because we hate it. Our attitude towards sin have to be the same attitude that God has towards sin. We have to want that thing to be out of us. We have to admit that it's unclean, it's un that it's a dirty thing, and that it causes us to, to just, but see, if your attitude isn't proper, is it, if your attitude is wrong towards sin, then you're more than likely going to go right back into it. If your attitude is, well, grace covers me, you, you know what? If you got that kind of attitude, then you're going to go right back into sinning and right back into what you were doing before. But if you hate sin, if you hate that thing on the inside of you that's causing 
that rift between you and God's relationship, then you know what? Then it more than likely you're not going to do it. Why? Because you're going to hate the feeling that you feel when it's done. You're going to hate the disappointment that you feel when it's done. You see? And so our attitude a lot of times towards sin is what get us in trouble with the Lord. We, we're going to look at two men later on in this series, Saul and David. Both of them committed sins. Both of them did things they didn't have any business doing. But if you look at Saul, his attitude was, ah, eh, you know, the people, they're the ones that went and got, got the sheep. I just went along with them because I feared the people. So come on, Saul, uh, uh, Samuel, turn with me and, and restore me back to my rightful place. He was more concerned with being the king than he was having a relationship with God. David was called a man after God's own heart. Why? Because when God called out his sin, he repented. He didn't say, well, she was the one up there on the roof bathing. And, you know, I was the one, you know, yeah, I was looking, but she didn't have she should have had that window closed. He said he didn't try to pin it on anybody else. He, he took the blame for himself. And because he did that, God forgave him and restored him to the kingdom. OK, so it's our attitude. Verse six. Let's read here. It says for this. Shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found? Now, let's, let's look at what they're saying very closely. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee. You see that? So what, who, who is it that prays that confession, that, that prayer of confession of sins to God? It's those that are godly. Unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto thee. So, what is what is uh, David telling us that we want to confess our sins in a time when God may be found? And we'll go over that if the Lord will in the next lesson, that there is a window that's open for confession of sins before that thing begin to take root and before we fall victim to it. Everybody understand. In other words, God want to. God want us to confess that. Well, here's what I've noticed, you know, in the years that I've been saved. That when I've noticed that I've done something wrong, the sooner I get it confessed, the better off I am. Why? Because if I say, you know, Lord, you know, I, I just pray I don't, right now I'm driving or right now I'm working or whatever the case is. I'll confess this thing when I when I'm later, when I have time to get on my knees and really focus on you. When I do that, you know what will happen before it's all said and done. I'll be done, done that thing again before I get on my knees to pray or altogether just forget that I'm supposed to confess it or forget that I've even done it. And so what happens as soon as you've done something that you know is against God's will or that you know God is not pleased with, you confess it right then. And right then the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to work. But see, the longer we wait, the longer we put that thing off, the, the more we wait, the more time that thing has to sink into our spirit and it becomes a part of us. And it will become a stronghold if we don't confess it. And now we can't help ourselves. So what happens from there? You get a reprobate mind. How? Why? Because you begin to say you begin to justify the sin instead of confessing the sin. Why? Because when it get down in your spirit after you haven't confessed it in a while and it get down in your spirit, the devil talk you into believing that that's just who you are. And God made you that way. Instead of Lord. Yes, I was born and shaped in iniquity, but I'm asking you to come and change me. You see, so you see, it, it, we have to do this thing in a timely manner. And if we'll obey this word, if we'll follow these scriptures and if we'll take the example that we read here tonight, then we'll continue on and we'll continue to grow. But when we when we don't do that and we just let it go and we just get, you know, just lazy with confessing our sins to the Lord. You know what happens? You become comfortable. You become comfortable with your sins. And pretty soon the devil began to talk you into thinking that God accepts your sins. And after a while, it's OK. I'm just this way. And what will happen? You will begin to infect other people. with what you got going on the same way Eve did. What, what did she do? She infected her husband with her disobedience. And that's not God's intention. Now, the last thing we're going to bring out in this lesson uh, for tonight is this, is that Adam and Eve tried to cover their sins by sowing fig leaves together. That wasn't acceptable with God when God called out their sins and got them to had finally admit that they had done wrong. What happened? God had to go. Get some skins of an animal to cover them. 
So what am I saying? That when we try to cover our sins, it's never enough. Never enough. When we say, well, that was in the past. It doesn't matter now. I have moved forward. That's not enough. Because the fact of the matter is you have not moved forward if you haven't made it right with God. And if you don't allow God to cover you. And that is, the, that is why we have that example in the Bible. What happened? Did God put the, 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 the coats of skin on top of the fig leaves? No. They had to remove those fig leaves. In other words, they had to remove what they tried to cover with, up with so that God could cover them. And that is the only way we get covered in the righteousness of God is when we have completely exposed ourselves to God. Everybody understand? All right, let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for this message that we've heard tonight, Lord. We thank you so much for preaching to us and allowing us to see the importance of confessing our sins, Lord. And God, we ask that as we continue to live our lives, that you will continue to manifest yourself to us, that you will continue to show us where we are in you, Lord, and the things that we may have in our lives that's not pleasing to you, God. And we ask that you will give us the humility to come before you and confess those things when we know that there are things in our lives that's not pleasing to you, Lord. Help us never to get relaxed with sin. Help us always, Lord, to remember that you are a holy God and that we have to be holy if we plan on seeing your face, God. And we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy, Lord. And we pray that our love walk with you will grow so that we'll get to the place where we don't want to hurt you. We'll get to the place where we want that the most important thing in our lives is our relationship with you, God. And we ask that you just keep us humble, keep us confessing our sins, Lord. And we pray and we know that by your word that you will continue to forgive us and continue to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.